We are going to keep right on going. Uh, I was at one time worried that we might not have time for this, but we will, we do, which is good because it's pretty important material. The next section we're going to talk about which I don't think is the next section in the book. It's in Sakai, but I think we're skipping a section. But inner product spaces. Okay, so remember when we introduced column vector? way back in section 1.3. And we had this list of properties that column vectors satisfy. And we then took that eight element list and we turned it into a definition. It became the definition of the vector space. We're going to do the same thing with the dot products. Properties that dot products satisfy are going to turn into a definition for something called an inner product. So say we have a vector space V. We no longer have to be looking at subspaces of Rn. And we have a function. Our notation here is we have those kind of sharp brackets. And this function takes elements of the vector space V and gives a real number. So this is just like when we had our n and we defined the dot product of vectors in our n and that was a real number. Now suppose that this function satisfies some properties. The V1 comma V2 should equal V2 comma V1. This is the statement in terms of dot products. This is the statement that a vector dot another vector order doesn't matter. And now this second statement, when you see it, I always think it looks kind of cryptic. U plus V comma W equals u comma w plus v comma w. And as I say, when you see it like that, it always to me looks sort of mysterious, but this is just the statement that dot products distribute over addition. Third, if we have a scalar, we can just pull it out. Again, something that might not look totally intuitive when you first see it, 
but in terms of duct products, this is the statement that if we've got C U dot V with our parentheses there, this is the same as having this scale with our C times U dot V with our parentheses there. Finally, U dot U, not well. The inner product of U with U, I haven't introduced the terminology yet, but this function where the argument is repeated is always greater than or equal to zero. And it equals zero if and only if U equals the zero vector. And that was, we had precisely that same statement with dot products. So this uh, list of properties, we want this function to satisfy. I mean, if you just look at it without any context, some of this stuff is kind of obscure, but we're just saying that we want this function to behave like the dot product does. If we have all of these properties, then this function is called an inner product. Honestly, not sure where inner is coming from here, but that's the terminology. And then this vector space V with this additional structure placed on it is called an inner product space. So an inner product space is a vector space with some additional properties, with this additional function. It's a... Uh, It's easy to give examples of inner product spaces. Some of them are more interesting than others. We could look, for example, at R N and the weighted dot product. So ultimately, I mean, these are uh, these normal equations kind of hide it. But ultimately, polynomial regression is based around the dot product. Right? To do this polynomial regression, let me move B a little further away so it's not blending in. But to do this polynomial regression, 
we have to project B onto the column space of A. And the projection formed of the has the dot product in it. So even though the normal equations kind of obscure that, um, quadratic or linear or other polynomial regression is done using the dot product. The weighted dot product allows you to perform polynomial regression where you want some of your data to be less significant than other pieces of your data. Like say you're conducting a long-term scientific observation. And I mean like 50 years, 100 years. So we've got a bunch of data. Let's say time data, T1, Y1, was our first observation, T2, Y2 was our second observation, and this is, as I say, a very long-term project. Maybe as of now, you've got 10 million observations or so over the course of 50 or 100 years. Well, let's say that while this is going on, you have been updating and improving your equipment that you are using to make these observations because your equipment is improving with time, your more recent observations are better and your older observations are worse. Now, if we perform any kind of polynomial regression with these observations, it's not going to capture that fact. Your polynomial regression is just going to say, okay, we have all of these data points. They're all going to be treated the same. What the weighted dot product does, let's just give a concrete example. Let's just look at the case where we have these three, uh, where we're in our three. The weighted dot product is the dot product, except that we have numbers in front of each of these products. And these numbers, these weights, Tell you how important you think that data is. If we think that this data is better than this data, maybe we think this data is twice as good as this data. So we could erase these. We could put a one here. And a two there. 
And if we then use this data to perform polynomial regression, the regression will treat that third data point as being twice as important as the first data point. Maybe as for the second data point, whatever. Or maybe our observations are getting better with time. So we go from 1 to 1.5 to 2, something like that. So that's just an example. There are others. Let's look at some space other than Rn and subspaces of Rn. Let's look at Pn. So the polynomial space. And let's look at the following situation. Once again, we're taking observations. So we've got some real world function. The heart rate of a patient after a drug is administered, whatever. And we're taking observations. How is this heart rate changing with time over the next hour, let's say? Well, you may know this. I don't know quite where this material would get taught in a major, but if you're on a closed interval, any continuous function can be nicely approximated with a polynomial. So if we assume that this heart rate function is continuous, and we're only looking at what happens um, over the course of the next hour, so we're on this closed interval, we might as well assume that this heart rate function is a polynomial. And now, imagine we have two sets of observations. So we're interested in whether this drug is messing up the patient's heart rate. So we give one patient a placebo, so like a salt packet or a salt capsule that we claim is the drug, and we give the other patient the real drug, and we want to see is there a difference in how the heart rate progresses over time. So we've got a set of observations for the placebo, We've got observations, maybe we measure the heart rate every minute. And we've got the same times, I mean, for the real drug, we measure the heart rate every minute as well. And now we want to compare the data. Okay, um, one, now that we've sort of seen the idea of distance, we could compare this data in a very literal way, or at least it seems like we might be able to. We would like to be able to literally ask how far are the placebo 
observations from the drug observations. If we can put an inner product on a piece of N, it makes sense to ask this question because distance was defined in terms of the dot product. So if we now have this dot product analog, we can define distance in terms of the inner product. So what would an inner product be here? Well, very similar to the dot product actually. To find the inner product, we take the placebo observation at time zero, and we take the drug observation at time zero, and we multiply them together. Then we repeat this with our next observation. In the example we've laid out, T1 is one minute, but we'll just write this down in generality. Then we repeat this observation, or rather we repeat this product with the next observation, and so on down the line. So very similar to the dot product. In fact, if you thought of the, I mean, if you just think of the observations you're getting as a vector of observations, this is the dot product. And then once we have an inner product, all of the stuff we defined in terms of the dot product can be defined in terms of the inner product as well. So the norm, the norm is the length of a vector. Now we can talk about the length of a polynomial. Or at least we can talk about the length of a polynomial given a specific inner product. So we can literally ask, okay, how long is the placebo polynomial? How long is the drug polynomial? Perhaps more to the point. Once you've defined the notion of length, you can define the notion of distance. So you can take the um, polynomial of placebo, you can take the drug polynomial, and you can ask, literally, how far away are these observations? from each other. We can do anything that, um, that we can do with dot products in an inner product space. So for example, We define orthogonality in terms 
of the dot product. So we can define orthogonality in an inner product space. We defined angles in terms of the dot product. So we can define angles in terms of inner products. Um, we can perform um, projections. We can project one polynomial or one function or one whatever onto another polynomial or function or whatever, because um, projection, orthogonal projection was done using dot products. Just take all of the forms of those we learned and replace every dot product with an inner product. We can perform the Gram-Schmidt process. If we have a basis that is not orthogonal and we want it to be orthogonal, we can do that. Um, I think in an earlier test, I gave you, I forget what, but I gave you a bunch of polynomials and I said, these polynomials have a special name, do stuff with them. Those polynomials are what you get if you take the standard basis, one T, T squared, T cubed, and you hit it with the Gram-Schmidt process and get an orthogonal basis. So, all of the stuff you can do with dot products, you can do in an inner product space. I want to introduce any questions. I want to introduce a very important inner product. And the vector space is going to be C, the space of continuous functions. I feel like I'm not 100% sure, but maybe linear algebra has helped to this too as a prerequisite. Um, anyway, I know, I guess you've, you've seen the integral before. Yeah. Okay, so... We define the inner product of two functions, and these are continuous functions on a closed interval from A to B. We define the inner product of two functions to be one divided by B minus A, times the integral from A to B times of F of X times G of X D X. Aside from the dot product itself, the thing that motivated all of this. This is the most important um, inner product in mathematics. It's not even particularly close because this inner product allows us to ask how close two functions are from each other. I mean, we sort of did that here, but we had a bunch of caveats, right? 
we'll assume that we have polynomials, we'll assume that we have only this finite set of observations that we're interested in. This definition of distance allows us to define the distance between two functions. And, it, and the, dis, the idea, the notion of distance we get is a very intuitive notion of distance. The notion of distance we get from this is Suppose we have a function and we ask what functions are close to it, like what functions are within a distance of one of this thing. Well, functions that are close to this function are functions that are kind of trapped in a tube surrounding it. So a function like that is close. A function like that that gets out of the tube is not. So it provides a notion of distance. And more importantly than that, it provides an intuitive notion of distance. And we should maybe sort of touch on that. I mean, any vector space has multiple inner products attached to it. And not every inner product is going to do what we want it to do. Like going, going here, we you we defined the weighted dot product here. If two of the three weights were zero, let's see. Hold on a moment. Okay, false alarm. We actually, this wouldn't be an inner product. So not a good example. Um, the reason it wouldn't be an inner product, let's try to turn a mistake into a learning experience, is that the vector one, one, zero dot itself is zero. And one of the properties that an inner product has to have is that a vector dot itself is only zero if the vector is the zero vector. So this weighted dot product carries on it the assumption that none of these weights are zero. Even so, I mean, just using the weighted dot product, we can define an infinite number of different inner products, right? I mean, if C1 is one, C2 is one, C3 is one, that's the standard dot product. If C1 is 10, C2 is three, C3 is five, that's a different inner product. So inner products aren't unique. And that's why I'm trying to sort of emphasize the idea that this isn't just an inner product. It's a useful inner product that captures our intuition of what it should mean for functions to be close to one another.
Okay, we kind of phased through that, but that's fine. Um, so we covered three sections this week. I think maybe at the moment only two of the assignments are visible. I don't think the assignment for inner products is visible yet, but I'll put it up. Maybe I'll give it a different due date since it's going up so late. But yeah, uh, two class periods left, and one of them is a test. We're right at the end of things. Yes, I will see you all next week to finish this out. And then for our final, is it a take home final or are we meeting in class? Uh, yeah, I like take home finals. Yeah.